Thank you very much. I'm uh, pleased to be here again, and I'm glad that you all came. Uh, I want to just uh, uh, say a few things. One is I'm also, it says, the uh, Division of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering, uh, but I'm also uh, in the Engineering and Applied Sciences. I'm also a Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Caltech as well, so just uh, for that. And I want to talk to you about work that's been done uh, with a former graduate student, Mu Wong, who worked with me several years ago. Um, and so it was supported by uh, both the National Science Foundation and NSERC, that is, Mu was Canadian, and so had a, uh, support from the Canadian government to do this work. Right. And you can read about it in uh, PRL we, we published a few years back if you want to read more details about what goes on. <coughs> so what I want to try to think about today is, uh, is uh, these experimental results on, so we're going to have colloids, uh, which are small particles dispersed in a liquid. These, are, these particles are probably about 100 nanometers or so in size, uh, submicron in size. And if you put them in solution, uh, so they're roughly nicely monodispersed hard sphere silica particles which were synthesized by uh, Peter Puzzi and Paul uh, Van Meegen. And what they notice here is they just put them in a container, and this is the volume concentration of these particles. And as you see, if you can see well here, if I'm below 48% by volume, it's a disordered liquid, a fluid. But as I increase the concentration, it starts to see little crystallites come out because hard spheres undergo a phase transition from a fluid to a solid at 50% by volume. And there's coexistence between solid crystals and fluid. And that persists, but if you go high enough, then the material cannot solidify any longer. It goes into a glass, what's called a colloidal glass. The particles are just jammed together. It's disordered. There's no crystallinity here whatsoever. So it's jammed into a glassy state. And that glass transition occurs about a 58% uh, percent by volume. <coughs> okay? So those are what's observed experimentally, colloidal glass. And these show you some uh, results, as I showed you this last time, about uh, particular contributions of viscosity. All I want you to take from this is this is the uh, shear viscosity uh, at low shear rates, a peculiar number going to zero, comparing experiment and simulations. And all I want you to get from this fact is that they seem to diverge at about the point of the glass transition. Okay, that's coming into a solid. And there's lots of other data as well. This is co compiled by uh, Bill Russell, uh, Jan, uh, Norm Wagner, and Jan Mavis in the Journal of Rheology a few years ago. The various experimental results as well as some theoretical results, all showing this is steady relative, relative low shear viscosity, that is the viscosity of the suspension, normalized by that of the solvent as a function of the volume fraction, and they all seem to be diverging around this point of the glass transition. Okay? So these are observations. Really well characterized, monodispersed type of particles. And we want to see, the question we want to ask uh, is where, uh, can we say something about where is this maximum packing? Where does this transition occur? And how does the viscosity diverge as you approach that point. That's what I want to talk about today. And we'll see how we can do that by doing some uh, numerical uh, simulations of this process. <coughs> and so we're going to do some, yes, please. Is it fair to ask what kind of, what kind of experiments these were, constant volume We'll come to that, OK? okay. Um, right, OK, we'll come to that. So please keep that thought in mind. Um, and so I'm going to do some simulations. And we're going to do uh, the simplest simulations possible. So I'm going to first apologize. Since um, all those symbol R's, which I filled your head with the last few days, I have none of them here because I'm neglecting the hydrodynamics. Okay? And I do that by actually putting all the R's down first, and there's a rational way to actually show that you can, what, what are the conditions under which you can ignore the hydrodynamic interactions, and I can discuss with that uh, with you. But so I apologize for having led you down this path with all these symbol R's, and now they're all gone away. Okay? So, so it's going to do what's called Brownian dynamics, and the algorithm is very simple. With this change in position of particles, it's convected with a linear shear flow. There's a random displacement due to Brownian motion, which has got zero mean and a covariance just by the diffusivity. And then there's a, um, we have a way to take into account when particles collide, a hard sphere collision. And we have a way which is a potential free algorithm. And that is simply the fact that you take a step from the convection and Brownian motion. And if particles overlap, you say, gee, I should have had a force going on. They should have ended up in contact rather than overlapped. And from that distance they overlapped, you can figure out what the force should have been. And from there, you can calculate what the stress associated with that collision is. It's a very nice method because there's no other parameter to introduce, so it mimics the hard sphere behavior. And um, we've worked out, and others have, to show that that does actually produce precisely all the properties of hard sphere uh, system that goes on. So that's the algorithm. It's very simple. And so then what we want to do is simulations. And so we put particles in a box. And normally, you put them in a constant volume, throw a certain number in, a certain temperature and uh, size. 
And so in the context of suspensions, what's important is the volume fraction phi. Uh, temperature goes into the translational diffusion coefficient, and I is the particle size. Yes? Well, no, because they, they don't over, they never, they just touch, they never overlap. And then we move them back to, we move them back to contact. Because I know the displacement I had to move them back from, and from that I can calculate the force that should have existed to have prevented them from overlapping each other, from that I can get the stress. Okay? It's a very simple, clever trick by David Hayes invented it, and it works very well for hard sphere systems. Okay? And we've shown that it gives you the right osmotic pressure and things like other tests and measures to show you that it gives you the right behavior for hard spheres. And when you conceive the simulation from next time step onward, did we? Uh, we do it again. There's a random step, so everybody, everybody moves again. And, you and their velocities will be opposite? No, these are over damped, so there's no velocity at all. There's no, there's no, there's no, no symbol u in this equation, there's no velocity, they're just configurations. You take a step with this and a step with that, and they may end up overlapped. They may not. If they do, you have to resolve the overlap because you say, I should have had a force which would have prevented them from overlapping if I were willing to pay for a smaller time step or put some actual potential through. I could have done it explicitly through a potential. But then I'd have to characterize what the rate of height that was, what its range was. I don't want to do that. I want to have them hard spheres. And so we have this other way to do that, which is a potential free algorithm, which results in a hard sphere collision. But it's not an elastic collision because these are overdamped particles. And you, you need to know the velocity before a collision to determine that force, do you not? No. Okay, that, uh, I guess maybe that's a mystery. It's great. It is a mystery. So um, what happens? Oh, there's, so I, I take a step. Let me go back here. Let me go back. People always ask these questions, and these are great. So we may never get done with a talk because <laughs> it's a, that's fine. So I, I take a step. I take, I, take, I take this step plus this step, and I discover I might have overlapped. And I say, oh no, that was a mistake. There should have been another force in this equation. This is a force balance, although I've integrated it, right? Should have been a force in the equation. And so, um, so I I, and I, and when I find and I, I ask, I find out how much delta x should have been to bring them. So that depends on the stiffness of the material of the sphere. They're infinite. I find out what is the delta x I need to have to bring them back to contact. I measure that. I had taken a time step delta t. That's a velocity. That's a force. I know my force. It is. Why? Equation of motion is that. That's my equation of motion. Oh, so you do need to know the velocity before the collision in order to. Well, I, 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 I know the step, <laughs> and I know the time delta T I took, so I know the velocity. Okay. I mean, I'm happy. I'm happy. That, that's fine. It works like a charm. Yes, go ahead. How much is the maximum overlap you consider? Zero. So what if after one time step, the particles are good enough? Well, you don't, want, you don't want them to run through each other. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Is there any limit on that? Uh, so no, but in practicality, they may overlap by 1%, for example. OK? You, yeah. if, I, if I could afford to have a smaller time step, I would take it. To to what have very small overlap, okay, but you know you trade. There's a trade-off always in a computational sense, but you can work out what the force is and then what the stress is, and the way you go. And it's a really nice algorithm which works like a charm. Hard walls and fun. No hydrodynamics. What is eta? The solvent viscosity. There's solvent, but there's no hydrodynamic interactions. There's still fluid there, right? Yeah, but it's not the solvent. But there's, it's I'm not doing it. Working against the collision through lubrication? No, there's no lubrication in this ca case. And, and, and why not? Because I didn't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> so, so the, the way, okay, okay, I may never get through this talk, but that's okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Exactly, you're having fun. So, so I'll explain to you, uh, w w if you do it with the, all the R's, and there is the lubrication that happens. So, so what's really going on is the following. So, so here, I a, here I have a particle that's got its actual hydrodynamic radius A, okay? And I'm imagining now, and so I imagine now that there's a repulsive force. There actually is a repulsive force which is at a distance B which is greater than A, okay? And another particle comes up and they can't get any closer than B, but their hydrodynamic core is size A. So the fluid gets to move through this thing, okay? And actually that can happen if I had electrostatic forces. They never actually come close together. They're kept apart at a certain distance. So hydrodynamically it's dilute, because hydrodynamics are based upon A, but thermodynamically it could be concentrated because it's based upon B. If you make B much larger than A, all the hydrodynamics go away, but all the hard surface collisions are there. So in this jargon, it's called thermodynamically concentrated because that's set by the radius A, but it's hydrodynamically dilute because it's set by just the size of the radius. So it looks like this. That's the hydrodynamic part, and that's B. Okay? And what is the, me what is the B associated with in your simulation? Say again? What is B associated with? In this case, I, I have, uh, this case, A shrunk to a point, okay? So I get the drag. That's how it works. That's how you do hard dynamics. And you can do this systematically, so I can vary B over A, dial in or out how much hard dynamics I want to have. If I let B go to A, then the lubrication comes into play, full hard dynamics. Let B go to infinity, no hard dynamics. And we've actually done that systematically in lots of different problems to vary, to understand what role does hydrodynamics play in a particular process. Some play, sometimes it plays a large role, sometimes it doesn't play a large role. You can systematically vary that and so on. And you can actually do that physically. You can make particles that have grafted change in the surface to keep them distance apart and so on by doing this. Okay? <coughs> and so that's one limit where that's, and that is what is Brownian dynamics, where you neglect the hydrodynamics. It corresponds to doing, having done this for the full hydrodynamic problem. Okay, so that's, so that's not, not how people talk about the dynamics, they just sort of throw them away, but that's what you have to do rationally to think about it that way. Okay? All right, good. We may get to that. Okay, so now, okay, with that, good. Okay, now we're going to put particles in the box, or in a periodic condition, we're going to do periodic, and what's important is the volume fraction, rather than temperature, what's important is the diffusion coefficient that sets everything, and then the size A, okay? And so now we're going to think about uh, put it under flow, so I'm going to put a shear flow on it with some shear rate gamma dot, for example. And then um, there are two non-dimensional parameters, the volume fraction and a Peclet number, uh, which is the shear rate, the particle size squared divided by the diffusivity, and the output then from a simulation would be the stress as a function of volume fraction and shear rate, non-dimensional shear rate. Okay, that's what you'd get out of the simulations. Right, okay. That's how you would typically do a simulation <coughs> at fixed volume or fixed volume fraction and fixed shear rate. But you could also do something, um, and that's what a rheometer does at fixed shear rate. You can also do something at fixed stress instead. I can apply a fixed shear stress instead of a fixed shear rate. And my symbol is going to be sigma, sorry, Jim, not S, fixed shear rate. And then um, in that case, then I have input as the volume fraction. And a Peclet number now based upon the shear, shear stress as the non dimensionalization. The output then is the shear rate and the stress. Okay? All right? And this is the controlled stress rheometer. That's what it does. Okay? You fix the shear stress. <coughs> and so, how does that work in the computational sense? Is that you go down and look at the formula for the stress. So this is the macroscopic average stress. There is the viscosity of the solvent plus Einstein's correction <coughs> times the local shear rate. And then there's the contribution from the particle collision, which is a function of the configuration. X here represents the configuration, not position <coughs> in space. Okay? So that's always how it is. The hydrodynamic part is always proportional to the instantaneous shear rate. And then the, this is the collisional part is just a function of the structure. Okay? And so from that, you say, oh, I want to know, give me a configuration. I can evaluate uh, this uh, configurational piece of the stress. I ask how is that compared to my set value of the stress, and I calculate what the instantaneous shear rate is. Okay? And that's how you go. Why don't you use other 
Why don't I use what other terms? Uh, the phi squared term. Because no hydrodynamics. Hydrodynamically dilute. dilute. But there's still this, there's still, I still have Einstein's viscosity because that's based upon this guy, right? So that's a single particle result you always get for free. But there's no interaction with hydrodynamically. We've done the, all the same thing I'll tell you today, we've all done it with the full hydrodynamics as well. Okay, so. so in a constant stress experiment, what is that stress output? You just share it as obviously an output. I, I've, I cut the total bulk stress, all components. Pressure, uh, you know, you got the full stress tensor, That's right? Normal everything, thing. everything, exactly right. And and so you can read about this with full hydrodynamics in this paper, uh, which the same you can do the same thing with full hydrodynamics. This is not special to having neglected. Full hydrodynamics works perfectly fine, and you can read about it uh, in this paper, okay, if you want to. <coughs> so let me show you some results of comparing um, this uh, procedure um, uh, for both constant shear rate and constant shear stress. This shows you the uh, viscosity not the Einstein part, just from the particle collisions, if you will, as a function of this non-dimensional shear rate for increasing volume concentrations. <coughs> um, start off with the blue, the blue symbols here, the, um, upside, the right triangles that are solid are all a constant stress. The upside down triangles are all a constant shear rate instead. And you see they all agree uh, pretty well with each other. There's a little difference here at high uh, shear rates or shear stresses and that's because when we first did the ones with a constant shear rate, they are purely monodisperse, and they do what's called string ordering. And the simulation we'll talk about now are all polydispersed to prevent crystallization. And so that's why there's a difference out here. But you see back here where there's not any string ordering, they agree perfectly well with um, what happens. <coughs> and actually, at constant stress, it's much easier to access the low shear rate, the low stress regime, where it all turns over into a Newtonian viscosity at zero shear rate or zero shear stress, and they shear thin and agree with each other. You got a question. Yes? Uh, in constant shear rate experiments, you said that like no dispersed particles, whether constant stress is a poly dispersed particle. Because if you do purely monodispersed hard spheres, they crystallize like crazy, both under shear and at equilibrium. And so if you want to get into the glassy regime, you need to have polydispersity. That's why. How much Ten percent. Ten percent. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> There's a well characterized thing, and that's what experimentally they do as well. So the experimentalists know to make their particles poly disperse a little bit, so you make you that prevents crystallization, gets you into the glass regime for hard spheres. And the size difference? It's a distribution. I, I can write, can look up exactly what it's for. So there's. A it's not just two different sizes, it's actually distribution of sizes. It's fairly narrow size distribution, right? Uh, often you'll see people in the physics community like to use 1.4 and 1. Why they use 1.4, I don't know. We use a distribution which is characteristic of what one does in the experiments. Yeah? So the question is like uh, whether we need to maintain polydispersity in both constant stress as well as constant shear rate experiments? You should make them always polydisperse. So we want to eliminate Yes. Right. If I did. Uh, and if I didn't do, if I did, if I, if I did uh, moderate dispersion for the um, constant stress, they'll all agree down here as well. Okay. Um, one thing, though, that you want to, I want to point out here, as you see, as we go to lower um, uh, stress levels at higher concentrations, it stops turning over. Right? It's got a, a viscosity going down with a slope of minus one corresponds to a yield stress. Okay, so we're picking up the fact that it no longer flows at 60% by volume. I can't, it's hard to get there at constant shear rate because you're forcing the stuff to move. But at constant stress, you're not, so if it wants to not move, it doesn't move. So that's a very useful part of the constant stress uh, types of simulations or measurements. Okay, you can pick up the yielding behavior, which you can't pick up at constant shear rate because you're insisting I have a finite shear rate. Okay. Okay, <coughs> so that's good. And they agree, so that's good. They should agree. That's good. So um, now I want to think about, go back to this, and I want to do uh, one other thing. Uh, so this was a constant uh, fixed volume. I could also fix the normal load or the pressure instead. Okay? And P, capital Pi is be my pressure. Okay. 
So for Jim, that's S and P. For me, it's sigma and pi. Just make the connections. So the, and so now, I now, now I, I I give you I set pressure and diffusivity and particle size, and so now I have two non-dimensional groups. I have the non-dimensional normal pressure, and the non-dimensional uh, shear stress. So normal stress and shear stress are now non-dimensional, and those are the input parameters. Output now, in addition to the total stress tensor, is the shear rate as before. But also now output is how does this thing dilate or expand? And so the output now is the volume fraction and the shear rate. Okay? And there'll be an expansion rate, which just tells me how much the volume changes. Okay, everybody understand now what we're gonna do? So the, I let the thing go up and down as it wants to. Okay. Right. So now you got a problem though. How do you do that when this is a suspension of particles in a fluid where the fluid is incompressible and the particles are incompressible? How do you let this thing expand, since things don't expand if they're incompressible by definition? So, so um, if you just sort of thought I'd going to move the plate up and down, then that's going to suck fluid in this way, and that creates a huge pressure-driven flow, and that's not a nice homogeneous kind of flow. That's not possible. The other way to do it is, put, is to put a wall, and put holes through the wall, and let the fluid come in or go out uh, through the walls, and that's how you actually do it in an experiment. And when you do that, you think about it for a moment, that means that what you're, what you're fixing is really the osmotic pressure, that is the pressure of the particles, not the pressure of the fluid. The fluid pressure is arbitrary, it can be anything you want it to be, and you're really fixing the particle pressure, or in the context of colloids, it's called the osmotic pressure of the colloids. That's what's being set. The fluid can get the leak in and out of that. So you can do that, and we have done that, and people have done that. Um, but that's not convenient from a simulation point of view, because I have to have physical walls present, and they're going to help do stuff, and I'd, ra I'd rather do a simulation which is periodic boundary conditions, an unbounded system. And so you got to think about, can I do that? And the answer is yes. Uh, yeah, and this may sound really strange. If I, I told you a few strange things already, so here's another one that sounds really strange. We're going to make the fluid compressible. That sounds really weird, but we will. So if you make the fluid compressible, it sounds strange, but you do. And so then um, you can actually show, and this is perhaps only true at Stokes flow, low energy flow, the fluid can be compressible, but the interactions amongst all the particles, even with all those symbol R's, are through the incompressible fluid. That allows the fluid to expand or contract, but all the hydrodynamic interactions amongst the particles are through an incompressible fluid. That happens to be a true statement that exists for Stokes flow. You can show that's the case. And you can read about it if you want to read about it, a uh, paper we wrote that discusses how to do that in JFM. As a result, there's an expansion. There's the bulk viscosity. That bulk viscosity is proportional to the shear viscosity. Okay? Um, and so that allows you to then have an equation for the pressure, which has a bulk viscosity proportional to a local expansion rate, as well as the contribution from the structure of the collision of the particles, just like you had, oh, where did it go? Just like you have for the shear stress. Okay? So I now, from a given configuration, I evaluate what, the, what this pressure is associated with that configuration, what the normal stresses are, what is the shear stress. I compare them to my set values, and then I can expand or uh, slow up, speed up or slow down or expand, so let it dilate or compress as we go along. Okay? And when you stop and think about that for a moment, you can also realize that now I can put a control algorithm on this, and I can let it expand or not expand. So you can actually think of all kinds of control mechanisms now for how you want to let the thing expand and dilate or compress. And you can ask, do I let it expand isotropically or just in one direction? All those are all possible uh, things to set now when you expand your notion of how you do these things. And is there no longer a need for fluid to percolate through the top? Correct. There's no walls anymore. Yeah. Now, it's now it's periodic. So now you've been able to figure out in your, in your mind, how can I just do a periodic box and, and have a properly posed system that does allow it to expand and contract, okay, even though it, the stuff is incompressible. That's the conceptual thing you got to get your mind around. And if you do it, let this fluid be compressible, it works out fine. And you haven't messed up how all the other interactions take place. Okay? And now you're away you go. Now you've got a system that's periodic boundary conditions, you let it expand and contract, and that's our constant stress, constant pressure rheology. Okay, everybody with me on that now? Okay, so we just let it go. So here's the first thing. <coughs> I'm showing you again the bulk of the, the contribution to the shear viscosity from the particles as a function of the stress uh, peccalet number. Um, in two cases, the symbols, the triangle is what we saw before, a constant uh, volume, so fixed volume fraction. Um, the squares are a constant, uh, same shear stress, but fixed pressure. 
and they are chosen. Um, this is, you'll have to get, uh, get with us. This is appropriate non-dimensional pressure with a thermal energy KT. Uh, <coughs> in terms of the osmotic pressure, it's 8.86. That corresponds to an equilibrium volume concentration of 45% for hard spheres. You gotta, it, 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 there's gonna be a lot of discussions of what that what pressure what means. They're always tell you what the pressure means relevant to what would be the volume concentration of the equilibrium hard sphere system. Okay? <coughs> and what you see is we see it sure thin. Now you see that the case at constant pressure, it's it's the same at low uh, stresses, but at high stresses it goes away because the system dilates. And so the volume concentration has gone down. And the way you understand that is to understand the fact that here is the pressure normalized by the number density kt, so the osmotic pressure, as a function of the stress Peclet number for various volume concentrations. <coughs> At low stresses or low shear rates, it's equilibrium. So these are horizontal lines. The stress goes like n kt. At high shear rates, high stresses, the stress is driven by the hydrodynamics. It goes like eta gamma dot. So it goes linearly in this non-dimensionalization. And that's the way the curves look. So if you go along a constant stress, then as you increase the stress, you have to dilate to keep the stress pressure constant. That's the most important thing I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you that again tomorrow. It explains an enormous amount of stuff of multiphase flow, is that if the pressure is constant, the stuff has to dilate. There's no option but that. A lot of things can be explained just from that alone. And that's what's happening. These guys are dilating. Stuff's going apart, okay? Because I fixed the pressure. But the pressure wants to grow linearly with shear rate, and so I got to get lower concentrations. What happened? There? Okay, back to this. So now I want to go back to this thing and call your attention to the fact that we're down here at the low, <coughs> low stress levels. These were constant volume concentration, and they seem to have a, a yield behavior. And so now we're going to look at the yield kind of behavior. But now we're going to do this at constant pressure, as well as constant stress. Okay, there we go. So now to flow or not to flow. That is the question, okay? I apply a constant stress, constant load, constant shear stress, does the stuff move or not? That's the question, okay? So how do we answer that? So this is going to be a, a non-dimensional pressure of five that corresponds to an equilibrium concentration of 62% by volume, a really dense system, okay? And <coughs> at, that's a zero stress level. Now I have apply a stress, and so let's start off on the right-hand side of this picture where the stress is high enough so the stuff can dilate and flow. And so uh, the, and it's going to be for all the following, all the solid filled symbols correspond to flowing states. All the open symbols are going to correspond to arrested states. Okay? And so what do I mean by arrested or non-flowing? That's a challenge. So let's start, and hopefully this is a big video to load, so I hope this happens here. Come on, there we go. So here's a picture down here at a, at a, at a Peckley number of 10. And this shows you in blue the strain as a function of time. And the strain is going linearly in time. So it's shearing nice and smoothly. And this shows you the volume fraction that fluctuates as a function of time about a value which is less than 62. It's, so it's dilated and flowing and flowing steadily. Okay? So here is a picture of that. This is a video. Uh, we colored it so you can see. And it shears nicely, wonderfully, and it all mixes together, and it flows, and it's a liquid. Okay? This is the value getting close to where the symbols get um, open. And this shows you now what happens here. This is the strain. Now, notice the values are much less. Strains are 10, 15. Before, there were thousands. Okay? And you see the material sort of strains a little bit. Then it gets stuck. Then it strains again and gets stuck. And you see the volume fraction fluctuations are much less and stuck at a high value. And then it grows a little bit like that. <coughs> um, and then we'll give you one even further in. Come on, machine. There we go. Back over here, peccary number of one. Now you see these are even strains of point 0.1, tiny strains, over an order of magnitude in time. Volume fraction is really dense, up to 62%. And you see, basically, there's a, an event occurred, and then it maybe creeps a little bit, if I can use that word, along here, but hardly goes anywhere. So the thing is arrested. So is it stopped or not? Well, it's a, this is a, always a problem. You know, if I waited longer, if I had more computer time, more money, maybe it would just keep creeping a little bit and flow, so you don't know. So I'm going to adopt 
the same uh, criteria that the experimentalists adopt, and that is when the viscosity has gotten, oh, I should show you a picture. What happens? This is the guy here. Uh, this is what happens. They're fluctuating, they're going brownie motion, but they're not going anywhere. Okay? So I'm going to adopt the criteria which the experimentalists adopt that if my viscosity is greater than 2 times 10 to the fourth, it's arrested. That's by definition of arrested. The definition, and you're welcome to not like that one, but that's actually the experimental determined the definition of, the, of arrested as well. Okay? So we're going to take that uh, as, as our definition. Uh <coughs> And um, that's a plot of what the viscosity is from this, con and you see the error bar start to get big and so on and, and so forth. There are other ways you can look at whether it's arrested or not. One is you can look at the diffusion of the particles under the flow, and this is the diffusivity, the self-diffusivity in the vorticity direction, the z direction. You see at high shear, high shear stresses that grows linearly with time, the mean square displacement in the z direction grows linearly with time, it grows nice and diffusively. As you lower the stress level, as it gets jammed up, it takes a while, eventually it might start to go. And if you plotted the diffusivity measured from the slopes at long time, as a decreasing function of stress, it drops to the small value right at the same point that we had the divergence of the viscosity. So that's another measure of arrested or not arrested. They particles can't diffuse anymore, they're locked in their cages. Okay. There's a third measure. <laughs> which is a uh, thing that people use to characterize uh, 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 collective motion in dense systems. It's called the chi-fourth measurement of cooperative regions. This is an experiment uh, work done by Eric Weeks and uh, colloids that I use confocal to measure that. You can see these guys, these regions are of rapid motion of basically stuff is a stuff, it's jammed, a fluctuation occurs and they all move together and you can characterize that by what's called this chi-fourth measure of this thing and this shows you this measure it diverges as you go from above, and then it goes back down the other side. Okay? So it's another signature of something going on at this value, and all those values correspond to the same place in Peckley number where things seem to get stuck. Okay? So there are three different ways. They all seem to agree that we're going to define arrested. What about microstructure? Do people look at microstructure in that state? Yeah, that's it. Uh, it's some correlation of the multi-particle multi correlation. So it's a four-body correlation that tells you something about what's okay. happening. So if you look at pair, you see nothing in the pair distribution. I'm thinking about orientational microstructure. So no, these are isotropic. There's nothing like that. No alignment. This, this, is, okay. this is quiescent. This is un, it's not underflow. It's quiescent. But just in the jam above the glass transition. Just a quiescent state. subject to a shear stress. Not this. Oh. Not these experiments. It's just quiescent looking at this thing. When you're just look, you're looking at do particles move and how do they move? They move cooperatively, a large region, because if one, they're all jammed together and you know, you've been in a dense packed room and someone moves and everybody goes, ah, and they get a step, right? And they all move collectively and then they get stuck again, okay? But overall they don't move what happens. And that's, this is a measure of that, an experimental measurement of that as well. And you can character, uh, do that in the simulations and then you see this uh, chi fourth diverging right at the same uh, arrest transition. Okay, so those are what's going to be arrested. Okay. All right, good. So now we've defined the system: constant pressure, constant stress. We can do those things. We can measure stuff. We can define our arrested condition. Now I'm going to discuss the rheology from a very different perspective than what people do in conventional rheology. I'm going to discuss it in terms of the mu i rheology. Okay? <coughs> the friction coefficient. So here our experiment. Uh, we have a constant stress, a constant pressure. Um, and if you think about the system, we'll first start about system sus uh, suspensions which are non-Brownian but purely viscous. Okay? So infinite Peckley number. In that case, then, the stress, all stresses must go like the solvent viscosity of the shear rate and some non-dimensional function of volume concentration. That's just dimensional analysis. And there's both the shear stress and the pressure. And I can make the, uh, what's called the friction coefficient, which I think I like the stress ratio is a much better way to talk about that. Okay? The stress ratio is just a function of volume concentration independent of the shear rate. Okay? And um, that's nice because then as you go near uh, jamming or near rest where these viscosities may diverge, this ratio is order one. So it's a nice way to measure something what's happening when both functions, both the pressure and the uh, viscosity are diverging. 
you can actually get a, the ratio is not diverging. Okay, that's what's the most utility of this kind of perspective as well. <coughs> Just as an aside, I've heard people in the past say that, oh, since the ratio of, sh of shear stress to normal stress is independent of the shear rate, it must be frictional motion. No. Purely viscous suspension, the ratio is independent of shear rate as well. Well, that's the question. We're going to find out. Okay. The answer is yes, but we're going to find out, right? Okay. So, <laughs> but we're going to find out. Um, and so, and this question, yes. Yeah. Why is it important to introduce that uh, pressure term uh, uh, to do that uh, rheology? Say again, please. Why is it important to introduce that pi term, pressure term, along with uh, that? Uh, why is it important to do pressure? Because it allows us to access this arrested region. Otherwise, it's almost impossible by a constant shear rate or constant volume to find this. If you try to do a constant volume, constant volume fraction, constant shear rate, you cannot access this region of the parameter space. At constant pressure and constant shear stress, you can. And that goes back to how, how a real experiment's done. And, um, I don't think the experimentalists uh, appreciated this aspect. They knew, they knew between constant shear rate and constant shear stress, but not whether they had to try to control the volume. And you have to do things about that. And so it's not quite clear exactly what the experiments were in terms of whether they let the volume of the whole system change or not. And that was not a control that people worried about uh, when they did these things. They just said, oh, it's incompressible, it's fluid, it doesn't matter, and so on. But the particle phase is compressible, and so that's why this is important. And so um, this is the comparison with classical mechanics, you know, normal force, tangential force, and coefficient of friction. That's where the ideas uh, originated from. And um, there was nice experiments by uh, Boyer et al. and, and uh, Marseille, in which they made a, a rheometer in which they could put particles in the fluid here. They exert a constant normal force. They have a porous plate to let the fluid leak out. And they exert a constant torque. So do experimentally exactly what's happened, in this case in the limit of high Peclet number, uh, so just purely viscous suspensions. And in their experiment then they uh, apply normal load, apply constant torque, they measure then the shear rate from which they can define the viscous number, the ratio of eta gamma dot divided by the pressure, you know what they load, and they can measure the height to measure the volume fraction. Because so their outputs are the shear rate, the volume fraction, same as we did in the simulations. Okay, you need to define this, the viscous number. I wasn't here earlier, and Jim sure told you about the inertial number, right? So this is the viscous number. <coughs> and this shows you that the results of these experiments, um, the stress ratio is a function of the viscous number. All the data collapsed onto a single curve. This is a law, law, uh, linear, linear plot. <coughs> Same data, but in a linear log plot to see you come down into a value, which is a 0.32 is the limiting value for this stress ratio as you go to uh, zero shear, okay? And also the output is volume fraction, and this shows you the output of the volume fraction from the measurements uh, as a function of the viscous number, and this shows you on a, a linear, linear plot, and this is a linear log plot. It reaches a divergence or a maximum flow in fraction at 0.585 is the number they get from their experiments, okay? So those are the experiments. Right, what's next? Oh, and they are also, from, the, from that you can figure out what the viscosity is, because you know how these functions are. The viscosity diverges at this packing fraction of 0.585 with a slope of minus 2. Okay, that's from the experimental results for non Brownian viscous suspensions. Yes? What is PP? What is, uh, what is PP? Yeah. That's what you measure. You, that's the weight that the, 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 the experiments. It's the load. It's balanced by the, the fluid leaks in and out. So the fluid pressure doesn't matter. You're measuring the resistance to the load of, by the particles themselves. There's, some, uh, to it. Okay. There's, a, there's a porous plate here to which fluid gets to move, but the particles can't escape as a screen. Particles can't get out. And you measure the pressure they exert on this load. From the particles only. Like for fluid we know Pascal's law. Say it? again? For fluids we know we have Pascal's law and it defines pressure, right? For particles, what exactly what is the physical 
know, idea of uh, particle pressure. What what is particle pressure? Right, as a particle, where do I find a particle pressure in the suspension? Well, uh, for this this particular uh, non-Brownian ones, there is nothing for a single particle because they don't move around. So in the colloid context. It's the osmotic pressure of colloid solutions. It's the, it's the ideal gas. The pressure is number density thermal energy KBT. That's true for particles in solution. It's called the osmotic pressure. You may have read about, read about it in chemistry some class. It's, it's happening in every cell of your body right now. You wouldn't live if you didn't have a good osmotic pressure, right? Okay, that's, so it's just a jiggling motion about what happens like that. Um, if you really want to know what the pressure is, you must come to my talk next week because I'm going to tell you about pressure, uh, that exact aspect from a, not, another point of view. So. Uh, if you, uh, not, this is not a good answer to your question right now, but that's what, that's what the pressure is. Can yes. I try a mechanics answer? Absolutely. Yeah. It's the transfer of momentum due to particle interactions across the surface in the material. Right, but if you had only a single particle, it's harder to think about unless they have some other fluctuation right, motion. Right. single particle. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, go ahead. Yeah. It is identical to Say again? It is identical to placing, I mean, considering a monometer and separating. Absolutely, yeah, sure. You'd measure the pressure, measure the height of the fluid. Yeah, yeah. you would. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's what the osmotic pressure is, right? And this is just the this is just the osmotic pressure way out of equilibrium. By a shear it. Okay. I mean. Oh no, I'm gonna get it back after these things. Oh no, that was a mistake, John. You're never gonna get back. These are giant files. Oh, I'm gonna be in. I'm going to be Herbert Space and now I do this stuff. Then. <laughs> <laughs> this, <laughs> this stuff here, right? This is the osmotic pressure colloid, but I've driven it out of equilibrium. And this is how it varies. This is uh, this volume concentration. There we go. It's going along here, and then I'm shearing it, so the pressure is changing because the microstructure is not the same as it was before. And there are additional contributions to the stress from the collision of the particles, and that starts to grow, and so that's what it is. And we're out way out here, right? And then and the manometer would change the would measure change in height level if I did this experiment. Uh, yep, please. For Brownian suspensions, osmotic pressure is understandable. For non Brownian viscous suspensions, what is understandable? I mean the exact same thing out of equilibrium. Exactly the same. You do the exact same experiment. No different. Okay? And there has been done experiments. I mean, Jeff Morris uh, with the group in France did precisely that for non-brownian particles and measured the change in height of a fluid that's in equilibrium, that's balancing the pressure inside. You took a system in there, particles in a thing with a screen there and connected to a mon manometer, and you turn on the shear rate and the fluid level goes down. Exactly as you do for the osmotic pressure for colloids. You would measure nothing then. It'd be zero then. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but under flow, it's not zero. Because under flow, I change the microstructure. Particles are driven together. They collide with each other. They transmit momentum. They, they can transmit momentum from their particle collisions and so on. And that gets transmitted to the fluid and knows about it. So here in the other Boyle's experiment that you are showing, mm -hmm. Can I can I leave this picture now? I have to because I have to jump forward in my thing, right? So, but <laughs> this is this is this is these are simulations. This is what this is what would happen. This is how it is. That's how the, the pressure varies as a function of shear rate for a Brownian colloid. It starts off at the osmotic pressure NKT, the usual stuff you would have. This is just this is just increasing concentration. That's what that's the carnahan starling equation of state describes the pressure of a hard surface system as a function of concentration. So down here would be the ideal gas limit, right? The low concentrations, and you go this thing, and up it goes, man. Right? So in the mm -hmm. hypoclein limit, mm -hmm. is it identical to the non-Brownian particle pressure? The KT will scale out of the absolutely. This grows linearly with this scaling, okay. and so it scales out. So this it becomes a it's a stress. And at, with, in the absence of brownian motion and viscous suspension, all stresses must go like eta gamma dot. That's the only, only scale you have. This, this stress must grow linearly in the scaling, and it does. I'm going to try to avoid being trapped into, into Herbert Hubbard space. All right, oh God, there we go, pass that thing. Okay, where are we, where are we, where are we? There we are, back here, okay. <coughs> We're back there. Right, okay, so 
In the experiments, they basically let the fluid leak out of the stuff, and, and, and so this thing is supported by the weight generated by the motion of these grains in here and how they bounce off each other and so on. That's, they bounce into the screen, and that supports the weight of the top. Okay? The fluid gets to come in and out as it, as it wishes. All right, uh, any more questions? That's good. Yes, okay. In what Morris is great, uh huh? Uh, so they actually conducted, they took the fluid out and they measured the pressure. You're right. But uh, how would it be a representative of the osmotic pressure? Because the fluid will actually experience a pressure difference, I mean, pressure drop across the membrane. Uh, as well as. Uh, no, the fluid does not, does not experience, in Morris's experiment, there's a screen. There's no fluid pressure drop across that membrane. The fluid pressure is equal in both cases. That's an osmometer that, that is, is for normal solutes, for a normal osmotic pressure, the fluid pressure is the same in both regions. It's the total pressure of this material is different because of the dissolved substance, but the fluid pressure is the same. That makes the chemical potential the same. Yeah, and if it is like osmotic pressure, it is the pressure exerted by the, it's the particle pressure, right? Right. So the particle pressure is actually getting transmitted through the fluid, but how could it, the fluid pressure is a representative of the particle pressure? Because they measure the pressure of the fluid. So you have uh, uh, have a membrane here, and I've got uh, I've got some volume concentration of my or, oh that's right I got my number density here, and I got my thing there, and I connect it to a manometer here, right? Okay, and then I measure the height difference because I know the total I know this thing this thing supports the weight across here the pressure of the fluid is the same on both sides because that's the equivalent of the chemical potential of the solvent being the same on both sides. So that tells you the pressure of the fluid, that tells you then the height, the pressure of the fluid has to be here for the height, okay? Over here I have a different concentration and so I get a different height because this over here they get the pressure is going to be the pressure of the fluid plus NKBT, right? And that tells you the height difference that happens. That's what you do. And that force difference is supported by the semi-permanent. So you do the exact same thing Except put this side under shear. Yeah, you actually have a cohesive. No, but it's absolutely it's just 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 under shear. This this region, I don't care. I, I, I can connect this to anyone want to connect it to anything else. Put under shear, and then I measure the change in the manometer height under shear. It's exactly the same. So the same particle pressure can be measured through the fluid pressure on the other side. Exactly the same as you would do for osmotic pressure. It's no different. So I mean, so so you have to so. You, you're not allowed to complain about the shear experiment if you, that, that the same complaint can be registered for this one. Okay, so if you're going to buy this for osmotic pressure, you have to buy that one. You can't have one and not the other because they're the same thing. So you can, you can not like both of them. That's perfectly, that's your, that's your prerogative, but you can't like one and not the other, okay? Yeah. Okay, and then we went through those guys. Diversions. Any more questions? Okay. This is, this is great. We may never get done, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. And so the last question I want to make is, is here's, for the, here's for the granular analog. Then the stress is now scale inertially. So they go to particle density. Uh, this is just u squared, gamma dot a, times now functions of phi. And so you get the same kind of uh, same stress ratio. And that's what happens for the dry granular media in this mu i perspective. And so that's what the dry granular stuff looks like as a function of the inertial number now compared to the wet suspension, non-browning wet, as a function of the viscous number. And okay, very much looking the same. That's why the mu i rheology seems to be a nice perspective on these problems. It seems to give you the same kind of structure, both uh, wet and dry. So the question <coughs> that I wanted to get to, okay, um, is what happens for Brownian suspensions? Okay, that's the question. So here's our non-Brownian guy. We have all this, this we got over here. Now for Brownian suspension, the stress is not just a function of volume fraction, it's a function of the shear rate or stress Peckley number now. Okay, and the pressure has got the usual NKT osmotic pressure and that the equilibrium osmotic pressure of colloids plus some other change associated with how it goes up with the function of, uh, of shear rate. And so the stress ratio has now a piece which is, if you just do the on, just scale it, divide, part which is the viscosity, but then uh, proportional to the shear rate, okay? And so it's not independent of shear rate. 
And indeed, if the shear rate goes to zero, then, the, then, then this contribution to compare the osmotic pressure part goes away. This is, goes away linearly. So this goes away, goes away linearly as the shear rate goes to zero, and that's, that's what's called a liquid. That's what it means to be a liquid. Okay? Normal stress differences for liquids start at order gamma dot squared. Okay? <coughs> so that would suggest these should, this stress ratio, this mu, should go down linearly as shear rate goes to zero for a liquid. Okay? And so that's what a brightness suspension would look like, unless there's a yield stress. Because if there's a yield stress, now the stress ratio will go to a constant as the shear rate goes to zero. Okay? Everybody see where, that's where we're headed? So that's, let's see. Okay. So now, uh, you're going to be here for more than uh, two minutes. You, you don't mind? It's going to be an hour and a half. I'm sorry. It is. But that's okay. Or maybe longer. <laughs> that's okay. Because it takes a while to explain these things. Because they're, they're uh, so, so what I'm going to do now, now just discuss results. <coughs> so it's all in terms of, the, of mu. And, and this is a funny plot because this is, these are set. I give you sigma and pi. And the output is the shear rate on this plot for fixed confining pressures. Okay, so I can find this pressure. This is a low confining pressure. This shows you what this function looks like as I vary, I change the shear stress. I reduce the shear rate, if you will, shear stress going down, and I measure the shear rate response output from the result for that fixed confining pressure. I'll show you the volume fraction dependence later on as well, okay? And um, it has, you can work out the relationship between the, visc the viscosity is just mu divided by IV, and it grows linearly, and you see that's a liquid. And you actually see the fact that it's shear thin. So if I plot it back in terms of viscosity as a function of stress, a shear rate, shear stress, that's the shear thinning. That's the curvature you see going this direction. Okay, so going this direction here corresponds to going that direction there, increasing shear rate. Okay, all right. <coughs> so that's what the picture should be in your mind. And so now we're just going to increase the confining pressure. Okay. Out here at high shear rates, high shear stresses, everybody collapses together because you're at the high shear rate limiting behavior. Now I decrease the shear rate, and as I increase the pressure, then you start to go that, but eventually all goes down and all it goes away linearly. So these are all flowing liquids, no matter how low I go. Okay. So let's increase the pressure a little more. And now we start to see places where, again, the open symbols now are the arrested ones, based upon my definition of the viscosity being greater than 2 times 10 to the fourth. So these now open symbols, these guys are creeping along. So I just put them there, open symbols, they're arrested. The pressure now is a certain value. You've got to think, what the heck does that mean? We'll see, we'll see volume fractions later on, here's what that means. But I'm going to keep pushing harder, okay? And these pressures are all normalized by KT, okay? They're all still normalized by the thermal energy. So I press harder, press harder. Now they're huge because they should go like eta gamma dot, not like KBT. And we see they all sort of nothing, a lot of stuff not flowing anymore. And they all collapse together down to this limiting curve, which has got then a mu at zero stress, zero IV, zero which is 0.16, and it's called SAP, we call it the shear arrest point. I don't, there's many maximum fracking, I don't want to necessarily claim it's anyone else, so I call it the shear arrest point, <coughs> okay? Push hard enough, stuff doesn't flow, they all collapse, if I push hard enough, high enough loading, to the same value. Okay, okay. that was good. What's next? Okay. <coughs> That's the viscosity, that's, that's this result, which gives me the shear rate coming out. Now the other output parameter is the volume fraction. So here's the map of the volume fraction. This again is at low uh, pressures, and this is the volume fraction now. <coughs> and so I think of this way as, oh, this is a complicated, I this now. So this way of going up, going down, so this must be the shear stress going up. Yeah, there we go, maybe going up. So I shear it dilates, goes increases, right? So that picture, right, going down here corresponds to going back in this direction and going back this direction is what it corresponds to, right, as you go down that way. All right. I press harder. I get the, you know, larger volume fractions now, okay, but they're still all flowing. All this is flowing stuff, okay, because they're solid symbols. Um, I'm going to press harder and now I shift it down so we can see things better. Now we start to see some arrested regions down here 
at high concentrations. And uh, we can see then the material dilates. What I mean by that is if you look this way, I started off down here at a low value of my shear stress for a given applied pressure, and the stuff just doesn't move, and then it dilates, then it flows. Okay, just what you would expect, what, uh, you know, all the cartoons you see. Well, I have to dilate the, the volume fraction decrease. I'm still arrested before I flow as a liquid. Okay. And you press harder. I can now get to higher volume fractions, but then I always have an arrested region uh, if I'm at low enough uh, shear stresses. Uh, and you press harder, and then you finally reach this limiting kind of behavior now, where now, oh, yeah, we press harder, we can't. <coughs> and I think that's where it ends up. And so you get a region here. You can't get any higher here because you're at infinite shear rate already. So everything past the, this it says forbidden, it says you can't press this space. That's the end of infinite shear rates. That's where you are up there. But there's a large region here of arrested states where the material doesn't flow depending upon the solid pressure that, over, over pressure that you exert and the values of the shear stress uh, that you have. Here I now put contours of constant viscosity on this plot. I know this is an awful lot to assimilate. This is just like, it blows my mind. That's why I'm hard to find to explain this stuff. Okay, so the contours of constant viscosity, you know, 10, 20, 50, 100, up to the 2 times 10 to the 4th, which is where we decided we call it arrested above this. That was our definition. So these are contours. So there's a mountain here, and these are the contours you climb up the mountain. Okay, and now in the space of volume concentration. And now you can start to go back and ask questions about um, what do you see in other experiments. Uh, so there's, that's, oh, that's arrested there, that's good. Okay. So now I'm going to walk you down a paths as when you did an experiment at constant volume fraction. What you would see is you increase the shear stress. Where that's traversing up those lines. And that corresponds to these curves here. At the blue, purple one, you're going and you see this stuff shear thin at constant volume fraction as I increase the shear stress. Okay? Then this one going on here, see I'm cutting all those contours, right? That I'm going down, that's the shear thinness you behavior down here. Here I'm right near this yield point, and then the stuff flows, and so that's these guys coming down here. Uh, I don't see anything that starts to, the stress has to be high enough for it flows, so they flow, and that's the shear thinning that you see down. That's what that corresponds, that's the conventional way you'd see it, but it's a fixed uh, volume fraction constant stress experiment. Okay, making sense? Okay. Also, you can go at it this way. <coughs> I could sort of go along increasing volume fraction at a very low shear rate, and that's what you would do if you try to approach the colloidal glass in most experiments, a very low, the, the equilibrium, the small departure from the equilibrium state, very, very low shear stress, so mu very small, but increasing the volume fraction, I approach the mountain in this direction. Okay? I point that I can approach the mountain in different ways. And you might see something different depending upon how you approach the mountain. Um, <coughs> and, so, and so now this gets back to we see these divergences of the viscosity as we had from before at low uh, shear rates. And so um, what's next? I don't know. Okay. So the important point I want, oh, actually, now, now, now I don't know why I had that one. Here we go. This is what we saw here. This is the low shear rate relative viscosity. Okay. But um, notice, and that's sort of down here where the glass transition is, this value down here at low stress levels, low shear rates would correspond to the just below 60% by volume. Um, but I can flow at higher stress levels, at higher concentrations. And that's also well known in the Colorado experiment rheology. Here's another plot from that same paper which shows the steady high shear rate viscosity, and I can shear to much higher volume concentrations because I'm up here. And that's also known experimentally as well. So the low shear rate viscosity, the maximum packing I can flow before I reach the glass, is different than the high shear rate viscosity. The microstructure is different. Okay? I can continue to flow as a liquid. But there's a limit. There's a point I can't go beyond, no matter how hard I try to flow, I'm stuck. There's a limit, I can't go higher than this. I should say that this seems pretty high, but at this polydispersity, the maximum packing fraction is still above this. It's like 68 per 67%. Still room out there to, to actually material to exist because it's a polydispersed system. And, be, and so there's still space. 
and not be a crystal. And we call that the mu at the shear rest point, and then the shear rest volume fraction uh, is at 64% for this particular polydispersity. Whew, complicated, isn't it? I think it's a pretty picture, but it's complicated. Okay, we're almost done, I hope. Everybody's in silence, I can tell. Right. And this is the picture from the data for the uh, mu versus i. Okay. So that point there is this point over here in volume fraction space as the output. Okay. So is this the jamming? I don't, I'm, who knows? I don't want to use the word because jamming has got such a history associated with it. That's why I call it the SAP, shear rest point, because it can depend upon the protocol by which you achieve that point. And our protocol was fixed pressure, fixed stress. Okay, that's our protocol. And a different protocol might get you someplace else in this space of how you look at things. Okay, so you have to be very careful about how you do that. The last thing I want to leave you with is back to the viscosity divergence. And now, the way we do this uh, calculation, the simulation, we're going along contours of constant pressure. So we're approaching the mountain in this direction here. Okay, and that's the way we approach the mountain. And when you do that, everybody diverges with an exponent of minus 2. No matter whether you are infinite stress, infinite Peclet number, or a zero Peclet number. They're all the same. Brownian motion made no difference for the viscosity divergence. All that changed is where the mountain is, not the way the viscosity diverges. Approaching it along a constant pressure isobar, that's the word. Okay? But if you approach it differently, you may find it diverged differently because you're approaching the mountain in a different direction. So it doesn't mean it's inconsistent with other experiments or theories for how things diverge. It depends upon exactly how you approach the mountain. Where you see the mountain take off and exactly how steep it is can depend upon the direction in which you come. Right? We've all experienced that. Okay? Constant pressure is the steepest ascent? No, here's more steep. Mode coupling theory would suggest that if I go along here a constant volume fraction, it would be steeper. It that, that doesn't seem to be consistent with the contours. So I was thinking in terms of steepness in terms of the contours. Well, it's, I, I don't think our data are well enough to, to say what the steepness is. But mode coupling theory, this is a theoretical prediction, mode coupling theory for uh, glass transition would have an exponent of minus 2.6. It's a theory, it's not an experiment. That would be coming down here at very low uh, stress levels. It okay. decreases the shear rate, fixed volume, and you're approaching the mountain uh, here. And so that it doesn't. looks like that might be it's, it, 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 it is perpendicular. These contours come in like this. This is coming in steeper. So it's not inconsistent with that. Okay? So, so this fact that you see minus 2 doesn't mean that they're wrong. It's just how you get there can be different. I think that's the most important message to take home from that, plus the fact that all that, according to what we find, Brian motion only changed where the maximum packing was, not how the viscosity diverged. That's an important conclusion. And when it flows, it flows as a liquid. Okay. <coughs> so I think the last thing I want to do, I want to connect, try to connect back to these experiments by Boyer et al. So now I plotted uh, the, their <coughs> our plot, a result for uh, mu versus IV, and I, I superimpose now their data. Uh, they found the limiting value of 0.32. Our limiting value was 0.16. Precisely a factor of two. Believe me, we looked for a factor of two. And in a lot of places, <laughs> man, did we look for a factor of two. Like you could have, oh, the diameter, the radius, I mean, all the different, did we divide by half, you know? And we couldn't find anything that was this nice a factor of two, even though the data support a factor of two. So what, what's, what's going on here? And what, what we believe is happening there, and I don't know for sure, uh, although we have evidence from other simulations, is that we, we threw away the fluid. There's no fluid viscosity present, right? There's no hydrodynamics. And if you look at the hydrodynamics, there's, a, there's surely the high frequency dynamic viscosity, which is getting very large, which contributes to the, the experiments have the fluid in there and so on. And so um, that may result in the contribution from the hydrodynamic interactions, which would enhance the viscosity compared to what uh, we have. And if I just do that, then we can just make the data fit 
on that by the factor of two and argued that if I add hydrodynamics, um, that could bring that into agreement. And we have done s work with hydrodynamics and it does indeed go in this direction. I can't say yet whether it's precisely that factor of two or not. But that's not too bad of a dif discrepancy because I think most of you would probably be willing to give me a factor two with having thrown away the fluid. You might be saying, ah, yeah, you get a factor two for the fluid, that's okay. <coughs> What's more troublesome is we look at where those things stop. Okay. Their arrest point stopped way back here at 0.585. Ours stops way up here. That's a big difference. And hydrodynamics ain't going to do that for you. I'm not going to get you over there. So, so a possibility is what's the volume fraction? That seems like a, a trivial kind of question to <laughs> ask, but it's not because in the experiment, um, the what do you measure by volume fraction? Because the experiment is only maybe uh, at most uh, 17 to 1 diameters. Because they, the particles, uh, there's a region of inaccessible volume at the periphery where particles can't exist. That's not true in the simulations. Our simulations, they're periodic boundary conditions, there's no issue. But here there are. And so, if you, how they measure the volume fraction, do they measure the volume fraction by the accessible volume to the particle centers, which is what you track, or do they measure by the actual volume itself? And they actually just, just just put the volume itself, and so if you just correct for the accessible volume fraction, just based upon the geometry they gave you and the size of the particles, just say that corrects for the volume fraction. I asked uh, uh, Olivier Poulokan did the experiments, and they didn't do this. So if you just do the accessible volume fraction, stay. Um, that shifts the data over there. Okay, just doing that. And what do you mean by accessible volume fraction? The fact that. I have to allow the fact that this, I can't get more particles one radii near the walls, right? So the volume fraction, you know, in a, in, a, in a truly infinite system, there's no boundary effect present. So the volume fraction, the volume fraction, here there's a region around the edge where it's not the... Uh, Are you going to exclude those particles? No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that when I measure this thing, I should have I said the particles could only exist in the accessible volume of the system. <laughs> rather than the volume that the fluid could exert that exists in that system. They differ by the excluded volume of one over the height side. Right? There's, no, there's periodic boundary conditions. There's nothing. There's, there's, ours are periodic boundary conditions. There's no, f no boundaries at all in the so simulations. The particle uh, asperities. You, you, took, you took smooth particles, right? Correct. No asperities. Right? Correct. But No, this, this, is, this is just the fact that, that a particle center can't come closer than one radius of the wall. Okay. That's all. One thing, you, you're making a point which is very clear, but I think there's also the point, what if they're not perfectly Of course, out? sure. No, but th that, that, does not ma that does not impact the volume fraction. Hmm? That does not impact the volume fraction. No, 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 but Because the, the volume fraction, you, you put n particles in there. Or you can, you can measure the volume of the fluid displaced, right? Yeah. So you could go back to, you could, no. so, so you've done that. So you can actually measure that. But the question is that when you went, so there's no ambiguity of, of how much space is and so on and so forth, how many particles, that's no, but then what do, you, what do you mean by that volume fraction compared to what volume fraction you get in the simulation makes a difference because I, if there's a region where I don't have, uh, I have not, uh, not space not accessible to the particle centers any longer. The, 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 there, there is that effect as well. Of course there's a potential effect, but I'm saying just I'm doing the simplest one thing is just say, oh, if I did that, what does that do to where that point is? Okay? That may not be right, may not be correct, but th what does that do? Okay? What you really want is to have the experiment done in a so of, twice as big. Of course you do. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that gets you pretty far back over there. So that may be th at least part of what the discrepancy in terms of where this arrest point is. The, the amplitude difference, I think, is just primarily the viscosity of the uh, hydrodynamic interactions and the thing which changed that. But the location here just seems to be an issue of, of measuring volume fraction. And it's important to measure volume fraction carefully when you're very close to this point. And then all these other issues that you raise about s asperities and so on and so forth are, are very important and, and, and can, can make a big difference. So. That's it. <coughs> um, I let you read those things. Um, so there we go. Thank you very much.
<laughs> be happy to answer more questions. Yes, please. So, uh, in the initial parts where you showed the excess viscosity mm -hmm. uh, due to the particles, right? Because you had only Brownian at that point of time, uh, so that's the reason why it didn't, they didn't show any shear thickening. Right? I mean, there was only shear thinning. Correct. They're only brown. They're, they're, they're sheared by brown. Yeah. No hydrodynamics. Yeah. They're hydrodynamically dilute, yet thermodynamically dense. Correct. Uh, so, are there uh, systems, experimental systems, which show only shear thinning as a function of uh, Peclet? For hard spheres? Uh, I mean, colloidal systems with. Uh, um, uh, so, if you, if you manage to get them far enough apart, then yes. So there okay. Are, there are things that never show shear thickening. Uh, um, if, you st if you stabilize them, then you can. then. Yeah, say stabilize will not sure thicken. If you sterically stabilize them, then they tend to they tend to uh, uh, delay sure thicken until you reach a point where you overcome the stress. So, so if you do the steric stabilization, where you graft polymer chains on the surface, right, like right. that kind of stuff, then um, they won't they'll, they'll stay to a high shear rate plateau for a long reach time until I get the stress levels such that they can collapse the polymer chains, and then you dry the particles. Then it sure thickens again, and you can then that, that's how you can discontinue sure thickening. It's one way to discontinue sure thickening that way. It might not be the only way, but that's one way to do it. Yeah, just Sorry. one more yeah, question. Wait, no, please. So, uh, when, when you had this yielding kind of behavior, right, mm -hmm. you did this, uh, so you calculated the viscosity which sort of increased uh, to <coughs> very large values. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the, me the methodology for calculating the stress uh, in that region from that Brownian uh, dynamic simulation, that seems uh, watertight, is it? There is no, this, I mean, this is still the same methodology used to calculate the stress, right? That's a very good question, and watertight um, is a very stringent criteria. <laughs> it's a very stringent criteria. Um, sure, there are lots of issues, um, and I'm not going to try to uh, gloss over that. Um, it's a tricky, challenging thing. Uh, uh, Do you even get a display? I'd, oh, they shut me off? No? There we go. Yeah, I mean, so. Um, you know, when it flows, it's pretty easy. You get back here, you know, these guys, large air bars, and, and so, you know, if, if I claim this is arrested, what do I mean by viscosity, right? So I actually have to average over some time and so on and so forth. This stuff, if you saw the strain rate behavior, it's intermittent and so on. So those are all kinds of issues. And then there are also the numerical issues when it's all jam packed together. How accurately do those kind of things? Those are all important considerations. Yet yeah. that uh, data is available, uh, obtained by this methodology, right? That it is. Way. It is. Right. No change in the methodology. Yes, Jim? So I expect that in your simulations between, let's say, a volume fraction mm -hmm. of 58% and 64%, you've got force chains that span the cell. Um, well, sure. And, and, and if you, um, I'm going to try to go through these things and I hope my computer won't crash. This is the, so you can, We'll let the we'll let this thing decide for us maybe. So those are not force chains. No, I mean I. I don't, they're flowing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, um, so in a flow like that, I'd expect you know if we were right. If you were illuminating yeah. overlaps, we'd see the chain. In the flow, you see the, they, 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 you see things going on. Right. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. I, I mean I can. Uh, there's another KITP talk I gave on discontinuous shear thickening, which has force chains and has all those things in it. And I can show you some videos of really nice force chains networks. So yeah. we well, can do that, so right? I, and I, and, and Here are these guys. That's a giant force chain in some no, sense. No, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. pure. Yeah, <laughs> pure that's force chain. That's really a yeah. more well, solid. Chain. Yeah, right. And I would say with your adjustment to the experiments of Boyer, mm -hmm. they must be seeing force chains. So I come back to this question of what is the impact of the existence of force chains on the rheological characterization? Oh, sure, sure, because sure, sure. they're then, in my view, looking at properties of their experimental device. Sure, sure. I agree, okay. I agree. Here we, we, have, we have a similar issue in that I want to increase the period by box size as well. Once I've got a structure inside which spans the unit cell, even if, even if it's something more simple than force chains, then you have to worry about uh, I'm being uh, set by my box structure. And I but I think it doesn't matter the size of your cell. I think you're still going to have force chains spanning the cell I, at, a, at a given volume. I time. think you will too. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. We can talk more about yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. Right. I, I agree. No, I agree. It's, a, it's an issue. And, 
And the simplest percolation notions would say you, even the low density, you percolate and you're always percolating. You'll never get, no matter how big your system is, you never get rid of them. I don't yeah. know if you always percolate, but yeah. that's right. something we can talk about. Right. Yes? So, in the original Stokesian dynamics code that you can get, so the shear thickening was attributed to the formation of the hydrocluster. Yes. So, as the volume fraction increases, uh, doesn't it like the, the cluster size increases and then that would lead to large stresses? Is it not sufficient to explain that, but rather than including the frictional contacts which lead to force chains? Uh, well, so a cluster is a force chain. I mean, so force chains was a new word introduced by the granular people, I think. But um, bef before then, <laughs> before then there were clusters, and we had clusters back. Uh, and when we first did Stokes dynamics, we, we for our first paper we talked about clusters. We actually measured the fractal dimension of the clusters. We just didn't call them force chains, but there are. And, and Jim talked about clusters. There are ch are aggregates of particles which are dynamic and change and so on and so forth, but they still have a, a size. And I, you can do a, a dimensional analysis or a simple scaling argument to show that you, uh, if if the if you have a purely viscous suspension, non-Brownian particles, um, at a given volume fraction, and if you increase the shear rate, and if the viscosity changes. It can only change by the fact that you form non-compact clusters. They have to grow, and that's what they do. So, and you, and and actually, okay. So when we first we first did simulations, which predicted that hard spheres should shear thicken, the uh, the the group that sort of uh, followed up on that experimentally was uh, Jan Mavis at, at Jerry Fuller, and they did experiments where they measured their turbidity change of the solution in the shear thickening behavior. The, the turbidity change, but they saw things which now scattered light because they grew. Did they span the cell? Uh, no, they were, they were, I don't think they were, I don't, okay. I don't know if they talked about it in that, 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 that stage. That's an important difference. Well, they, well, but, you know, but, they, but you can get the shear thickening, in fact, the fact that shear thickens means you must have clusters. They, they're, no, no, they're, 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 yeah. Clusters affect the reality in a, in a important way. But for me, when the, Change, the cell, it might change the oh, sure, but but the point is that the, the, the non-serious shear thickening can be associated with growth of objects which yeah. were non-compact, were not big enough now to scatter light visibly to make it, the solution turbid. Okay, so there's no doubt that things happen. It was not just homogeneously dispersed any longer in that sense. And there were things stuck together that were persistent long enough to scatter light that you could see them. Well, why don't we, I, I'm happy to give yet another talk sometime. I'm here. No, I'm serious. I'm, I'm very serious. <laughs> I've got I'm very. I have a wonderful lecture which will take an hour and a half again, about <laughs> <laughs> about um, discontinuous shear thickening from hydrodynamics, and they show all these things. And but you can also watch it in the in the privacy of your own home, if you go to the KATP uh, website in Santa Barbara, and it's been recorded, and there are jokes and there are things thrown at me from the audience. So it's much more entertaining to watch that. So. <laughs> So can we ask questions? Yeah, yeah, afterwards, absolutely, yeah, sure. <laughs> no, please, go ahead. The yeah. point I was asking is like mainly is it because the hydrocluster formation is taking place along the compressional axis and that cannot span the entire system is not able to explain the discontinuous shear thickening? Or is there any, is there any other reason why the hydrocluster won't explain the discontinuous shear? Because the force sense, we, uh, as we understand, they actually span the entire system in all directions so that it's making completely a sudden jump in the stress, but whereas these hydroclusters are particularly have a specific direction without actually spanning the other direction. How do you know they have a specific direction without spanning the cost of the thing? Who says? Who said that? I, mean, I don't know. Gosh, it must be no. <laughs> particles in contact within these hydroclusters, like are they touching each other within the hydrocluster? So, what's your definition of touching? I mean, are, they <laughs> are they in contact? Yeah. Um, they can, they're, they're held together by lubrication forces alone. But uh, how does it explain the, I mean, uh, shear thickening, discontinuous shear thickening, like he's asking, right? I mean, if, they, if you need infinite force to bring them closer to each other, mm -hmm. and the normal force varies as 1 upon r, the tangential force varies upon log r, we'll never have a friction coefficient as high as explained by DST. Right? For DST, the 
Viscosity jumps very high, right? right. The tangential and the normal forces are of co comparable magnitude. Right. So hydroclusters can't explain that. Right? So what you need to do, so, so in that sense, yes, but um, that doesn't mean hydrodynamics can't. If you were to make particles now where the tangential motion due to roughness, but still hydrodynamic, is as stiff as the normal motion, then you get exactly all the same phenomena you see by putting contact friction in. But that, pretend, that, that requires a particular model of, of asperities on the surface. Not of, much of a model, a no. It's a forest of trees that are the asperities. It's a, it's a undulations of hills that give you that coupling between the tangential and the normal force. I watched the video. Oh, good, yes. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Right, sure, it's not a force series. It's not that kind of thing. No, right. But, but, but the point of that video, and you're welcome all to see that, so you don't have to listen to me. You can do it on your, on your sound. It's, 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 entertain, it's more entertaining than this talk, because people yelled at me and stuff, so it's kind of funny. Um, but um, it, the, the point of that really is, um, so the, the, the most important, the, the, the real, the really essential message is the fact that <coughs> um, if you form an aggregate of particles, say, along the compressive axis of the flow, as you just said, um, pushing them together this way is hard work because of the, the lubrication singularity is one over the gap spacing. But I can slip out sideways without anything. Okay? And the other thing to know is the stress goes like the length cubed. Right? That's just true. It goes like the size of the object, whether it's, whether it's a sphere or a thing. And so if I break it in half, an object of size I can now have two objects of size, you know, L over uh, 2 squared, and so the stress went down by a factor of 4, just by cutting it in half. Just move one particle, I cut it in half, I stress went on a factor of 4, okay? So if I have a long aggregate that's, that's 100 particles long, I cut it in three or four places, I've dropped the stress by two orders of magnitude. That's the important physics. Now, whether you argue that it's tangential friction which prevents you from going sideways or bumpiness or whatever else, that's not essential. What's essential is this aspect of it. Okay? That's what's important. Because you break it, you break it, you drop by an enormous amount. And that's what that whole lecture was about. And all we did was say, oh, I think I have an idea how by bumpiness could result in tangential sliding being as difficult as normal sliding. And he put that in. And that's what comes out, okay? <coughs> and the utility of that, I thought, was the fact that um, you took the existing computer program and you went and you said, at replace log epsilon with one over epsilon. You close the hood, press start, and out it comes. You don't need to do anything else. So that's kind of convenient, okay? And, and what you see then in terms of the signatures are exactly what people had seen with the contact friction models. Exactly. Without context. But that's the important physics. Just change the lubrication. The important physics is you need to do something to make it hard to slip out sideways. And smooth, nice spherical particles like this can slip easily. It's logarithmically singular. It's almost nothing. Logarithms are nothing, more or less, right? If you make it hard to do that, then the force chain that gets built is st stiff. It's persist. And then it connects the network to each other and you actually get a square array at the end of the day. They're not, along the, they're not at all aligned along the compressive axis. It becomes very, very square-like. But that's the important physics of what's important to do. And then exactly how that comes about. It might be bumpy things. It might be, it might, might be all these things playing together. So in one sense it doesn't matter what it was. The result is very robust at the end of the day. Whether I put kind of friction in or I put bumpiness. So that's good in a way because that means all these systems would do this. Okay? It also tells you then, um, if I don't want it to happen, what do I got to do? You know, and sometimes you don't want it to stick, you want it to flow. Okay? But that's the important feature. That's the, that's the, that is the thing. And you just do this. You don't do anything else with that. I mean, and you can, you know, if I, if I have a particle chain of 100, and, then, and that chain, then how, how long is the chain? It's the gap spacing. Count the number of particles you got. And then ask, how many links do I need to break to drop it by two orders of magnitude, and that's discontinuous shear thickening. Well, do you think shear thickening is associated with spanning the gap, or can you have it? No, you, you, can, you can definitely have continuous shear thickening without spanning the gap, for sure. That's, what I said, what would you that's for sure, yeah, absolutely. I mean you apply the same mechanism, but you right. guys don't have to span the gap. Absolutely, right. Because, <laughs> that, that, you know, if I 
Yeah, that if I just build aggregates that are non-compact, then I, I increase the hydrodynamic viscosity just from this reason alone. So making the tangential uh, interactions as, as comparable in magnitude to the normal interactions, you were, you were able to actually extend this chain from one end to the other end, but which is mainly directional, like along the combustion axis. Whereas in case of force tensors... No, no, it becomes... A high, uh, you got you to view the video. Because uh, I show this, because you know, it happens once you get into the severely discontinuous shear thickening regime, once you're way up there, then the force chains are actually on the network. You get chains that, that connect everybody together. We have a nice simulation, nice animation of those things. I, c I actually can show it to you now if you want to while we're still here. We but can they're not oriented at 135 degrees to the flow? Well, no. Oh. We, we, can, we, can, we can, for those that want to stay, <laughs> can stay. For those who want to go home, <laughs> you may go home. Um, there you are. There you are. <laughs> I, I, can, can I? <laughs> can I go home too? <laughs> no. <not laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's see if I can find this thing. Oh no. Oh no. You'll get to talk about this video later on in your future talks. Like the K80 video. <laughs> oh, there's K. I went to the wrong. File. There we go. If it doesn't crash, it doesn't crash my computer. It'll be good. Okay. So that was same student who did the previous work we just talked about. Mu. Okay. This was just Mu did this because I just had this idea and asked him. It was an aside. It was not part of the thesis. It's not in the thesis at all. It's nowhere published except online now at KTAP, KATP. So. Anyway, so um, why don't you just go to cut to the chase? Okay, visualize and symmetric structures. So here we are. This is this is going to be a discontinuous guy. We're at uh, 50 pecker number 200. We're down here below. It's this is the viscosity of discontinuous shear thickening. And we're going to see what happens if it runs. And what this guy is up here is going to this viscosity is a function of time. Up here is going to give you an amplitude. And I forgot the details. We said particles are connected by a line if they are um, separation distance is less than that of the sum of the radii, pretty close together. And this gives you the intensity, the amplitude of how much that connection is. And this is using the hydrodynamic yeah. mechanism for the tangential. Yep. Yeah. So, so these guys, so you see clusters by this step, and these are really severely connected together along the compressive axis of the flow, more or less. Okay. But that's before it's uh, gone into the shear thickening regime. Um, and and this, the, the particles are all scaled in size. You can see them. So guys that are small and tiny ha are carrying very little stress. You can, you can assign to each particle how much stress it carries. The red guys have the lot most stress. The white guys have very little stress. And they're sort of shrunk inside so we can sort of see through the whole thing. OK? What's happening? Nothing. Stop. Here we go. This is now when we start to uh, shear thicken. Now you see the network that's formed. <coughs> There's still much so along the compressive axis of the flow. Well, they, and they seem that some of them are spanning the cell. Oh yeah, and you'll start to see some. But you start to see some horizontal connections as well. Okay, this is still this is 50% by volume. Pick number 386. Now the intensity has gone way up. You know, because they, they're, some of them are as high as 50, even though the average value was 20. Okay, so. And then you go to higher still, and now the network is, is, is that's not along the compressive axis any longer. Okay? And I think we have one. Oh, this is, the, oh, this is even higher. This guy's crazy. 56 volume you're fraction. Way down, you're down below. Yeah, no, but higher concentration. Oh, okay. Okay. So way down below, basically isolated guys. There's still force chain, there's still clusters in here because my de our definition is. Is this is a tiny number, right? You're asking particles to be within a, hundred, a thousandth of their radii apart. Uh, so really, only, only those guys are defined to be in contact in this measure. There we go. It's a complete network, which if you do statistics, it's more square, and we've done statistics, than it is anything else. Yeah, but I would say, so the significant fraction of the forces are being carried by contact. These particles never touch each other. Me? These particles never touch each other. <laughs> right. So what do you mean by contact? Yes. This is all borne by hydrodynamics. It's all what? Borne by hydrodynamics. Okay. It's all borne by hydrodynamics. Yeah, so those contacts are really lubricated. Right. Contacts here. 
Shear rate dependent. Yeah. But they're at high enough shear rates that no longer see it. No, they're not. They're not shear rate dependent. It's infinite shear rate. These guys, right? Yeah, pardon me. Is this? This is. This. These are. This. This. This persists at a constant value no matter what the Peca number is. So it's shear rate independent. So how do you? Okay. So what is? So in your view, what is the nature of this material? It, it's yielding and. Well, it's still flowing. Yeah, at this flowing, high but stress. It's shear rate independent. That's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's like a, a rate-independent plasticity. If, if you say so. Well, <laughs> I'm, well I don't know what it is. It, it doesn't seem to be a fluid to me. But, 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 but I just showed you earlier, even for the Brownian systems at high Peckley number, way down, not, not this sure thickening business, it's also rate-independent. Yeah, so I would say you change the nature of the material from a fluid to a rate-independent material, you might call it a solid. And in the transition, you have a mixture of fluid like behavior and maybe but like but, but but this but in a certain way this the, this rate pen here is no different than that. I mean it's still flowing along at, at a constant uh well, there right? is rate there's a rate dependence in the lower branch. Yeah, a little bit. A little, a little bit. bit. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you might say there's still a little well yeah. as you get a little bit further that seems to diminish. I'm saying it's a different material. You've made a different material. I'm not, I, but it's still a it's still a flowing liquid. No, it's not a liquid. Why, Why not? Well, I would say liquids have to be rate dependent. It's not viscous. Sorry, viscous. It's not viscous, is it? It's rate independent. This is this is the viscosity. Oh, it's, I'm that's the viscosity. The graph, the graph is the viscosity. It's the viscosity. Okay, so it's still a rate. The material. It's a liquid. Itself. It's a liquid. It's a liquid. Flown at a constant. No, no, I'm sorry. I thought you were applying stress, not no. viscosity. Okay. So still liquid. The stress is still dependent on the rate. The sure, yes. Yeah. It's growing linear with gamma dot. Okay, no. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Then what I said was. Right. Okay. But the network formed is, you know, and this is a square network. It's got not at all on the compressive axis of the flow. It's quite a different beast. And you can compute the contact topology. You can get hysteresis if you do a constant stress as opposed to constant shear rate. So all the phenomenon that one that had attributed prior to contact friction, you can see all that phenomenology without any contact friction and all the stress being borne by the hydrodynamics alone. Uh, so the, uh, the lubrication is actually normal at So we know that particle A, particle which has in size A, uh, is moving with velocity U with a separation epsilon will give us a fun by epsilon. But now this tangential lubrication which you are considering, there are surface aspect aspects which are actually when they are moving, when the particles are moving tangentially, the interaction is normal. But uh, right, that was the idea. The asperities are, are of the same size as the uh, epsilon gap. Right. Here's the picture. Particles are rough. And so we just said the particles are rough. If we move them tangentially, if you blow it up, then there are pieces of it which are moving normally. That's all we said. That's all, I mean, that's all it is. If they're rough, if I do this, there are pieces of it which move that way. So these pieces are being squeezed. So they should have a squeeze piece. That's all we said. Okay? That's just, this is the simplest, stupidest idea. That's all we did. Okay? There should be a squeeze piece. And then you say, okay, well, you know, should you really do a calculation? That's too, I'm, I can't do calculation. It's too complicated to me. So I just said, oh, they're squeezing. So I'm just going to make it, you know, put a function in there which does that which has two adjustable constants, I, I admit freely, and I just make it so that it does that, so that it goes to zero at some point, it's continuous, so you don't have, because we have to take derivatives of stuff for brownian motion, so we don't want it to be continuous, and that's it. And then literally all you do is go in the program and you replace this with this, and you see what happens. And if I vary my coefficients, that is what, at what height does, does it turn on, that's what h naught measures, so H not measures the height of the disparities, if you will. When do I turn it? And alpha measures how much of them they are. If I have alpha zero, I had no disparities. And H not tells you when they start. So those are reasonable, not constant numbers, which you could then take a rough particle and say, oh, H not sounds like this, and alpha sounds like that. And, you know, and so you could actually try to back them out and see that experimentally and so on. And you just do that. Just see what happens. Just see what happens. <laughs> just see what happens. <laughs> 
This is the, this is the main point. This this is it. I agree. This is the important piece. Absolutely right. And and you know and Jeff Morris agrees. But this this is the important physics. That's what's important because that's what stabilizes these things. So whatever you do, and there can be many things that you could do which could have that effect. And then they all seem once you've done that, they all seem to behave in the same fashion. Okay. And so that is a good thing in a certain way. That means that that's also why things seem to be robust. That all these systems do it, behave in the same fashion because that's what's important to have done. And then after that. After that, you just created this network, and the networks are then more or less the same, and they all do the same thing. Whether, and whether the stress is being borne by the thin lubrication gaps, or it's them being borne by the actual contact, it doesn't matter. They still, they still, the stress is still this big, that's, that's all it is. I mean, in this case, back to the rod, the stress of this rod here, just a single rod by himself, with um, lubrication, oh, let me go back and show you, I did that. Sorry for giving you guys yet another lecture. That was important earlier part of the talk. There we go. Stress goes like length cubed. Okay, <coughs> so this is a case where it's a rigid, a rigid rod, and vary the length. That's the stress. I'm going to do case two. <coughs> I have the particles are um, have n all force free, just lubrication interactions, nothing between them, and it's identical. Not just scaleless, it's identical. Then I'll do three, I'll put them together by short range repulsive forces. It's identical again. So from the measurement of the stress, you can't tell me whether it was a rigid rod, whether it were short range repulsive forces or lubrication forces. It, you can't tell me what was the source of the stress. You have to do some other experiment to distinguish between those three cases. Okay? You can't tell. So just because you measure something and say the stress, you can't tell me what was the source of it unless you do some additional measurement which can interrogate which was the one responsible for it. Okay? And then all I got to do is make sure that tells me that, then this tells me what's important for how big it is. That's, that's all there is to it. But by your theory, yeah. short range repulsive forces are not important for suspension to undergo gear right? Correct. That, but it doesn't mean that, 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 but it could be. Another system may be one where it may be dominated by the Sherman forces in some sense. So they could be playing a role. So, but it's not, it's not, it's not, um, so it's possible that it could be that way, but, but you don't have to have that to have this occur. I mean, people have reported that it is necessary, right? I mean well, that they're making, they're over, they're over claiming something because you can't tell. You cannot tell. And, and, and all the experiments people have done, all the people, you cannot tell what was the source of the stress that bore the load. It could have, because the stress could be a rigid rod, it could be repulsive forces, it could be hydrodynamics, and they give you the exact same value back. So you cannot tell from that alone what was the source of it. So let me say, let me they could all be right, but yeah, okay. But let's uh, suppose that they're putting in elasticity and friction. Mm -hmm. You mean deformable particles then? Pardon me? Deformable particles? Yeah, okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And that is part of the story, although mm -hmm. their elasticity is a little bit suspect. Yeah. <coughs> well, then there is an elastic mechanism for the transmission of force. Mm -hmm. And you may be able in a in a device, mm. especially with the first change spanning the cell, you may be able to measure that elastic. Absolutely, no, but it, yes, yeah. I'm not I'm not saying that, that 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 what they say is incorrect or doesn't happen. But you have to do an additional type of measurement to probe those issues. That's all I want to say. Okay? I'm, not, I'm not telling you that the lubrication is, is the mechanism either. I'm just telling you that if you make this simple model, it'll behave the same way. And so you cannot tell. You need to do something additional to discriminate what exactly is going on. That's the real message. Right, but, 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 the, my, the, but there's an important point because I got this conclusion, then people then assert this must have been the source of it. And that assertion you cannot make. Okay? And that's people have asserted it in those strong words that I just used. Okay? And you cannot assert it. That's what got me involved in this stuff. I think we got pissed off and said, ah, I'll do something different. <laughs> okay? You have, to, you, have to, you have to think more carefully and probe more deeply. And that's good. That, there's lots that, that sort of opens up more possibilities. Uh, but then coming back, then the ultimate phenomenology all looks very much the same. 
So if, uh, if this simple thing, you cannot discriminate, and, and that's robust in a certain way, then all the systems sort of behave a, have a generic behavior. But then if you did something different, you might find they peel apart in different ways. I think Jim would agree with that, probably, right? Yeah. So maybe. Want me, want me to do the experiment? Sure. <laughs> well, you could do it. Yeah, I mean, you could do simulation wise. You could do it. Well, you could do it with soft particles. Yeah, you right? can do, I mean, one, one, one way to do it would be systematically simulation, do these stuff and put, put all these different pieces and do it in such a way and see what kind of experiments you would need to do or whatever else to test the difference. That's one way well, to I do think it, yeah. For example, that Sato mm -hmm. uh, does experiments with soft particles, I think. Is he doing experiments? Not experiments, simulations, yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in his simulation, he should be able to distinguish, let's say, an elastic contribution well, present when he has the mechanism he uses is elastic content. Yeah. So he should be able to measure it. Yeah, but, but he has measured it or not. No, but no, but they but they have they have measured that, so they have measured they have they, they, they from the microscopic they can say in my simulations the stress is borne by this elasticity. Okay. Well a portion of the stress is borne by elasticity. Well, his case is all born by elasticity, I think. But yeah. Okay, it's all born by that. But that doesn't, but I just told you that it I can't tell. No, I didn't. Well, so if you need the force chains go to the top of the device, you could perhaps. Right, I'm saying, but you, have, you, have to, you have to ask another question. You have to measure something else. And maybe, maybe, it's, yeah, maybe, maybe you should do some oscillation on top of this to measure some other kind of, yeah, exactly. of response aspect yeah, yeah. to yeah, sort out, out what is what's going on. Okay, but just, you know, so he knows from simulations how much w was doing that, but you get to more than that. I mean, there's a Cunningham experiment where they sort of measure the resonance shift with uh, lubrication between the particles, the particles in contact, and they deduce from there that it, the particles have to come in contact, right, in order to explain that. Like, during DHT, they come in contact and... Uh, who's done that experiment? Okay. Uh, I'll confirm it. Right? Okay. Something. Okay. So maybe yes. Yeah, but you, all you can say is in that experiment, they were in contact, let's say, elastic contact, yeah. right. but they, they don't have to be. Right. Yeah. They have to be other. So in, instead of uh, rigid or semi-soft particles, mm -hmm. we have emulsions where you know the lubrication is, is very different. So the mechanism will be, th these kind of things will not be there. I don't think they share thick in the emulsions. And there is a very nice work by Michel Clot and Roger Bonacase, which have an elastic hydrodynamic deforma deformation, they can actually get a lot of emulsion behavior can be all understood in the same framework, all from basically the thin gaps that happen between the deformed surfaces and how that is affected by the uh, hydrodynamics and the squeezing motion between those things and with the boundaries. And so they I'm can wondering when you get go from a rigid right. particle to a deformable particle all the way to an emulsion, right? So in a deformable soft sphere, <coughs> uh, will the lubrication be still similar or I mean because they significantly deform so I went to the other limit of an emulsion so there there is no shear thickening or DST. I don't think there is any shear thickening emulsions. They can, they, the, the, the objects are, are sufficiently formed but they deform it and flow then they, you can go then to 90% by volume of these guys it gets so you emulsion. The, def the deformation of the particles yeah. and the emulsion acts against the spectrum. Yeah. I mean, if I were, if you were a self-respecting party, you'd just squeeze through there and oh. deform. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why, why bear, why bear the load, man? Why bear the load? Why not just go right through? So yeah, right, right. Any more questions? I have lots more talks in here. We can, we can keep going. I don't think we're due for dinner for an hour or so. We can keep going. I'm happy to keep uh, telling you all the stuff I don't know. But you should, you should go online because it was funny. I made some jokes and comments about people and stuff like that. I, I thought it was funny. I had a good time. So that's I thought he was nasty. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like Heinrich. I was nasty to Heinrich. He's a good friend of mine. But uh, anyway, so yeah. Yeah, but they, but, they, but they squeeze through the gap here, so I don't have to form these big, huge chains, right? So, I mean, if, so you, were, if you were a self-respecting particle, you, you would go like this and, and squeeze get through. You get flat. And okay. only the tangential. Yeah, is. right, right. And so then, 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 but then the gap dominates, and it's that local sliding dominates and the deformation dominates, and that's where you can, from knowing that, you can build a model where that's the key feature. And that's what uh, Michelle Cloth and Roger Bonacase have done very well, both experimentally and simulations and theory, to explain a lot of behavior of the rheology of soft emulsions and gel particles and so on. People have also, in the colloid business, tried to go back to your question, 
um, make star-like polymers and then make them stiffer or to try to see where they become squishy versus how hard sphere-like they are and so on. But those are all down in the low shear rate, very Brownian kind of regime. So they're not thinking about the shear thickening element, uh, just trying to see where, how, how does it differ from a hard sphere-like behavior and so on. Yeah? You said something about hysteresis in DSP. Like, uh, even if we do experiments of DSP in Stokes flow, why, why do we see hysteresis? It should be reversible, right? It should retrace its original path even to DSP. But you said there's some hysteresis. Who, sa who said that? Um, they seem to be fairly reversible, if I recall correctly, but I'm sure you can find conditions when they're not. I mean, this, this, you can get this kind of crazy stuff. If you do constant stress, you can do S-shaped curves, so it's unstable. So this... But the line is constant stress equation. Yeah, constant stress. Okay. You and can the then get... Rate, you can get that. Yeah, and but this is al this is also uh, unstable, mechanically unstable. So you, they can only realize that in a small box simulation, right? The real system then does something different because this is mechanically unstable with a negative slope. So you then tend to f get stuff that happens in regions. Well, regions get stuffed together. Other regions flow more easily, and so on. Yeah. Well, could your other curve be a simply jumping? Yeah, sure, yeah. right. But that's the constant shear rate versus constant stress, right? You can never, at constant shear rate, you can't pick up the hysteresis. Yeah. Constant stress, you have the chance to, to pick that up. And tell us anything about the nature of the tran uh, transition, right? Uh, is, is it like wa water going to ice? Like ah, transition? well, that's a, that's a very deep question. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay, I'm sorry I've taken all of your time for so many hours. <laughs>